part of the Press Play Podcast Network. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Sable Brothers on the Baseline Podcast. I'm your host, Scott Sable. And I'm John Sable. How are you guys doing? This is going to be a fun one. This gentleman really requires no introduction because he has done it all. He's seen it all. He's traveled the world. He's been a coach. He's been a television analyst. And he's also had some other jobs, too. Who are we talking about? Former Cleveland Cavaliers coach Mike Fratello. And Scott, Mike Fratello not only coached the Cavs, the Atlanta Hawks, the Memphis Grizzlies, the Ukrainian national basketball team. You mentioned his color analyst and studio host jobs for many networks over the last 15 Mm -hmm. to 20 years. You know, he's a guy that the Cavs brought in after legendary head coach Lenny Wilkins. Right. And uh, took some of those old Cavaliers teams from those Coliseum era into the uh, Gundarina expectations really didn't get to where Mike wanted it to only because of injuries. Uh, Coach Rotello talks about that also talks about his odd. I I say odd because it's an uncharacteristic ranking in his uh, climbing the ranks of coaching because he right. had a really random degree. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, exactly. And we're going to talk more about that. We'll talk about the transition period, like you talked about, John, in the mid nineties and how we remember the Cavs going from the Cavs of the eighties into the nineties. And we'll also talk too, you know, about the current Cavs and just talk about his view of the NBA in general, a lot of stuff to go over and we'll hear more from coach Mike Fratello when we come back from the break. Hey, everybody, it's Sam Amico from Cavs on the Break NBA podcast. Be sure to give us a listen for all your Cleveland Cavaliers recaps, analysis, breakdowns, draft talk, free agency. The list goes on and on. Give us a listen, Cavs on the Break NBA podcast. Hey, it's Tito, host of the Premier Fantasy Podcast. Get all the news and analysis you need to dominate your fantasy league. I've been doing this as long as anybody in the business. I can help give you the edge in your leagues. It's the Premier Fantasy Podcast, part of the Press Play Podcast Network. Hey, everyone. I'm Holly Wetzel. And I'm Jeremy Powell. And we are your hosts of The Orange is Oranger, a Cleveland Browns podcast on the Press Play Podcast Network. We give you all the dog pound coverage that you'll need each week to get you ready for kickoff and beyond. Don't miss our breakdowns of each week's matchups, game recaps, and any and all news out of Berea to feed your Browns appetite. As we all know, Holly, dogs got to eat. That's right, Jeremy. Hit that subscribe button and never miss an episode of the Orange is Orange or Browns podcast on the Press Play Podcast Network. This gentleman really if you're a old school Cavs fan requires no introduction if you're new to the Cavs um, ask anybody who's been a Cavs fan for a long time they remember former Cavs coach former longtime NBA coach longtime television analyst Mike Fratello is joining us today coach Mike how are you doing and I know you're doing a lot of traveling so thank you so much for joining us well, when you put two long times together, does that mean it's a very long time that I was around? <laughs> I'm wondering. Two, two long times together equals very, very long time. The older I get, it seems like everything is getting longer and longer, and I'm losing concept of time. Speaking of time, Coach, um, before we get to uh, your history with the Cavs and everything that you're doing, It was a few years back, and I'm saying a few years now. I always joke around because, you know, when my great uncle used to say a few years, that was 30 years ago. But this is about six, seven years ago. You recorded an audio clip for us when we were asking about my brother and I. And my brother and I go back and forth about this. John, I know we we always talk about this. Can you kind of take it from there? Sure, Will. Uh, Coach, I'm not going to lie. I'm a little disappointed in this audio that was leaked out a few years ago, and it just came to my (laughs) attention of uh, you and Scott here talking about basketball and my skill set and talking some smack. And I have it right here. I'm going to relive this memory that was posted on the interwebs on April 10th of 2015. <laughs> here we go. Hey, Coach Mike, you all right? How's everything going? Hey, Scott. Good, good. Hey, Mike, I was kind of wondering, you know, I sent you some video of my shooting. 
And did you have a chance to take a look at it? What's your What's your impression? You know, when I talk about shooters, right? We're talking about Ray Allen, right? Uh, Mark Price, or <laughs> Banish, who recently retired, absolutely, like you are. Mm -hmm. um, and I kind of put you in the same category. I, I speak of all three of them, and then your name comes right really? after. That's yeah. an honor. It's great wow. form. It's a great release. Great follow through. Your concentration. Sure. Um, you have a chance to make it now, wow. as Excuse you me. know. Analytics is so big now in the absolutely. NBA. Absolutely, sure. And I happened to do a little research, mm -hmm. and uh, you have a brother, John. John, yeah, absolutely. He's yeah. on Twitter. He's on social media. Yeah. Based on numbers, yeah, he has absolutely no chance. Really. None. Wow. Yeah, I thought he was the one who said his shot was smooth, and he's got some work to do. Is that pretty much right? Well, he speaks well, talks well of right. himself. However, right. right. the numbers don't matter. Right. 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 Well, that's that's a shame for him. Keep working on it. I appreciate. Thanks, I Coach. Good. Appreciate. It. All right. Thanks, thanks, Mike. Appreciate. It. <laughs> so, Coach John, John, I, I let me just say this, John. Let I, me I, just I, say I, this. <laughs> okay. Did, did I say that? Was that me? Yes, it was. I, I'll own up to it. However, I also want to say that I was in the confines of a TV studio that a certain person, both you and I know, works for. <laughs> and how could I embarrass him in oh. front of all of his fellow employees and say that you were by far the better shooter? I couldn't do that at that time. Oh. He was a little bit down the dumps. I could tell he was having a tough day. I tried to motivate him. That's part of what coaches do. So I was trying to motivate him, try to pick his spirits up. Oh. And then, Something like this comes back and bites you, and, and I oh. I have to apologize for that. Oh. Yeah, Coach, I, I take your apology, and, and I accept it. I was wondering how much money you paid Scott off, oh. but now that I know the background story, it totally makes oh. sense. And you know what? He, <laughs> knowing Scott, he was probably predicting 90-degree weather in April in Cleveland, and that doesn't happen. So he, if he, It was if March, he, but that's okay. Yeah. So that, that was a fun little thing we did there. But uh, uh, for the record, though, I am still a better basketball player than Scott. That's uh, – that's a conversation for a different day, but, uh, correct. You are correct with that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's funny. I love that. Every time I hear that, it cracks me up. Yeah. So, it's good. It's good stuff. Yeah. We want to thank you for that. That was great. So coach, take us back to your early years growing up. Where did you grow up and what sports did you play? I grew up in Hackensack, New Jersey, which is North Jersey. It is right next to the George Washington Bridge into New York City, into Manhattan, not far from Yankee Stadium when you cross over the bridge. And I've said many, many times, if I had it to do over again, if I could play it again, I'd do the same exact thing that I was exposed to for all those years. It was just a great, great place. Our school systems were outstanding, the public school systems. Yeah, there, there were Catholic schools that you know, private places. But, you know, you grow up in, in the city and you go to the public school. We had unbelievable teachers. The coaches were fantastic. And it was some place that I always felt gave you a little bit of everything. It gave you a really good education. At the same time, it gave you street smarts and savvy and, and a feel for what's going on around you that sometimes youngsters miss the swirls around them, but they never quite get it. And uh, it was a blend of all that, uh, the exposure to, if, if you said what was Hackensack c composed of as far as, you know, personalities, nationalities, uh, the racial mix, it was a little bit of everything. And, and you, you had the pockets of the different cultures, uh, the different nationalities at first ward, second ward, third ward. So you were exposed to all of that growing up throughout, you know, Little League Baseball. And we were part of that first movement way back when of Little League Football when it first started way back when. And then, um, you know, obviously we had such an advanced city with the athletic programs. Our gyms were open at night in the city uh, two nights a week. Every elementary school gym was open to the children in the city. Uh, so you could go on Tuesdays and Thursday nights and, uh, get to the gym at six, close down at nine and you get three hours in the gym on Tuesday and Thursday nights. Maybe it didn't help your academic standing very well, but it helped you make a shot every once in a while. And, you know, that was all part of growing up in Hackensack where I wound up playing throughout high school, football, basketball, and baseball came through all the programs on the way up and then went on from there to Montclair state college, which was back then, um, 
a smaller school. He probably had 3,000 students when I went there and now has grown into Montclair State University. And I was in the Panzer School of Physical Education and Health Education, a you know, separate school within Montclair State that concentrated on putting teachers out there in health and physical education. That's where I graduated from. Wow. Did you have anyone pushing you one way or another? Family members, um, coaches? Um, was there anyone that kind of stands out in your mind? My coaches in high school were the biggest influences on me growing up. You know, my mother and father were working people. Uh, my dad was a two-time Golden Gloves champion, then turned pro and had X number of professional fights, uh, but worked from, you know, leaving the house at 4.30 in the morning, uh, getting back after dinner time. And sometimes he'd, you know, if he, if he wanted to break away and be home at five, you better be at the table ready to go when he walked mm -hmm. in because he was running right back to work again. So, um, you know, as a youngster, uh, I had uncles that would probably see more games when I was young growing up or take me to more games, Yankee games, Dodger games, whatever they might be, than my dad actually could because of working. My mom worked also. Yet when I got to high school, they were the two biggest supporters. They never missed a game. They were, I'd see him 10 seconds after a kickoff or a tip off or the first pitch. I'd see him along the fence in his white outfit from cooking in the kitchen that he owned a little tiny luncheonette restaurant. And then he'd be gone when the, when the clock or buzzer or whatever went off. He'd be gone back in his car, back to work again. But they were there for everyone. So it was important to them. And, the, you know, I knew that they were supporting me, but there was never like a push or he never asked me to play anything. He, he just let me kind of go where I, I kind of wanted to go as far as my interests and then tried to support it as best he could. When it got to, you know, choosing of colleges, that type of thing, neither one of them uh, got past. They never graduated from high school. Either one of them, both, both sets of parents pulled them out of school at a certain age and, told them they were coming to work, you know, in the family businesses, whatever they were. One was a meat market, my grandfather's meat market on the one side. And on the other side, it was a, like a, what a supermarket would be nowadays. It was kind of the first market in that North Jersey area for fresh produce and things like that. And he pulled my mom out of school. Uh, so both of them got as far as getting to high school and that was it. And their, mm -hmm. their education was over there. So me going to college, getting a degree was a huge thing for them. When did you know you wanted to go into coaching? Gosh, I knew that way back. Uh, my coaches were such a big influence uh, in my life and uh, were so important to me. I, I idolized them. I, I thought they were the greatest. I, you know, if they said something, it was true. You didn't, <laughs> nobody could convince me that something was different or maybe that they weren't exactly right. I just believed what they said. Uh, and that's, uh, I was very happy in following the things that they had said would be best. And I knew back then I wanted to, and, and I never had, a, being honest, I was never a guy uh, that said, I, someday I want to be an NBA coach. You know, I, I wasn't like that. I, my own high school brought me back. I was hired as a, a teacher and a coach. I was an assistant in football and assistant in basketball. Uh, but the head high school coach in basketball was 46 years old. The head football coach had just, my old football coach had retired then and gone on to become the athletic director. So the new football coach had just taken over. I knew he was going to be there for a while. And I did not land in the gym, which is the way I saw the whole thing happening, become a, a gym teacher and then be able to coach and be where I love being in the gym all day, but it didn't work out that way. They had no job teaching physical education. So they asked me for the first year of going back, would I go back and get my degree over the summer in driver education? So oh, I wow. became, believe it or not, a full-time <laughs> driver education teacher in high school. My first year out of college, I taught four behind the wheels during the day. And I taught two classroom situations which were overcrowded, <laughs> two classes of guys in a classroom together trying to teach them driver education, of which 
being honest, I knew that you put a key in a car and it needs gasoline once in a while. That's about as much as I knew right. about cars. But you, you move along. And at the end of that first year, I got a call. Somebody said, would you be interested in a college coaching job as a freshman coach in college? I said, uh, well, you know, where? And they said, University of Rhode Island. And I went, I got to talk to my head coach. So I went and sat with my head football coach, the guy I played for. And I told him I had an opportunity. And normally he was like, you know, the mother hen that keeps everybody under his wings. You don't stray off from Hackensack. But he actually said to me in the, in the quick meeting we had, he said, no, he said, you go. He said, that'll, that'll be good for you. He said, you're, he said, you're, you're different. You go. And I was like shocked or wow. I thought he was going to say, no, you don't want to stay here. in Hackensack." Mm -hmm. But I think he realized that the basketball coach is going to be around for a long time. The football coach is going to be around for a long time and that I mm -hmm. was ambitious. So he gave me his blessing. And I, after one year in high school teaching and coaching, I was at the University of Rhode Island. Wow. Coach, that's such a great background on how you got into coaching and growing up there in New Jersey and how you started to make your way in the coaching ranks. And then from, you know, those years in college there, you eventually moved on to the NBA. You broke what is an assistant coach for the Atlanta Hawks, then eventually became the Atlanta Hawks head coach and then eventually come to the Cavs. But before we talk about the Cavs, I, I kind of want to go back just a little bit into um, your Hawks days but how it turns with the Cavs because you faced some of those great Cavaliers teams, the Price, Doherty, Nance teams, teams that you actually ended up coaching later when you came to Cleveland. When we hear nowadays, these older players reflect on their playing days. We've heard Michael Jordan's mentioned in the last dance documentary about the Cavs probably would have beat the bulls and won a title if they didn't trade Ron Harper in 1989. And then we had, you know, your buddy, Mark Price uh, on the podcast over the summer. And he agreed with that sentiment. As a Atlanta Hawks head coach in 1989, when you saw that trade happen, I'm sure you were surprised. But were you also in that same camp of Price and Jordan where you agreed that that really killed the Cavs' title hopes? What it did is it took one more weapon away that you had to prepare for, worry about. And, uh, you know, instead of them becoming stronger, I believe the move did not exactly pay off in dividends immediately. Mm -hmm. So as a result, now you take something away without replacing something that was really an integral part of that whole team. So, you know, there's always speculation with that coulda, shoulda, what would have happened. Uh, but I, I just know through personal experience in Atlanta, we had a deal come up and we wound up giving up Tree Rollins and Randy Whitman in a trade that brought us in. And this was part of the selling pitch to me, you know, brought us in Moses Malone at mm -hmm. the end of his career and Reggie Theus nearing the end of his career. And when they presented it to me, I said to them, listen, you're giving up two of our five starters, two glue pieces on our team. The captain, Trey Rollins, and Randy Whitman, who was as intelligent a player as you're going to find, a terrific open shooter, came off screens and read them as well as anyone in the league. And I said, yeah, you're bringing on two talents, but are they going to go along and understand that this is Dominique's team? He's going to take X number of shots. Doc Rivers has the ball in his hands, you know, runs the show. But were they going to be able to handle all that and fit in? And... I left a decision, you know, I, I, when our owner wanted to do it, I didn't think I was going to tell Ted Turner, no, I'm not going to do this. So, <laughs> you know, you, Ted wanted to get it done. Our GM and president of the team had talked with Ted about it before I was brought into the meeting. And they had convinced him that that was the thing to do. Bringing two All-Stars on would make us that much stronger. I, you know, I tried to make them aware of the fact we were very, very young team tree being the oldest guy and we had just lost in game seven to the boston celtics in an uh -huh. incredible game seven my point was let's keep what we have and just add a little something to it to make us a little bit stronger if we can but just coming back with a year experience and that playoff experience of seven games i was kind of anxious to go to battle with that group but we made the change 
We did win 50 games the next year, but got knocked out of the playoffs in the first round. Mm-hmm. We just never were the same team chemistry wise as we were the year before. So Ron Harper, talented Ron Harper. Could he have helped that? Yeah, he certainly could have helped that Cavs team. Would they have done better? That I can't answer. So, Coach, we're going to fast forward now back in, into the 90s here. So you ended up replacing Hall of Famer Lenny Wilkins. You know, I think that was like the 93-94 season. You know, you've already, at that point, you're an established head coach with Atlanta for, I believe, seven seasons. And coming into Cleveland, did you feel any pressure following, uh, following a coach like Lenny Wilkins? Well, keep this in mind. Lenny Wilkins then wound up getting the job in Atlanta. Well, that's true. <laughs> Yeah, he did. <laughs> spot. So I wonder if they asked Lenny if he felt any pressure going into Atlanta. <laughs> yeah, that's uh, true. That's a good point. No, no, just I'm teasing. Of course, if you knew the opening conversation that I had with Wayne Embry, when Wayne said, if we brought you in here, we're bringing you in to win a championship. Mm-hmm. So does that put pressure on you? I don't well. know. <laughs> and anything <laughs> other than. Yeah, you're supposed to win. Uh, Winning every game and winning a championship would probably be good with front office and ownership. Um, I knew why they brought me in. I I had an understanding. We talked about it. I was anxious for the opportunity to coach that team. And then, unfortunately, you know, maybe the most unfortunate thing that happened throughout the coaching career is I lost Larry Nance, two knee surgeries in my first season. He retired at the end of the year. I lost Brad Darty, who had the major back surgery Mm -hmm. to repair the two discs that had blown out. He retired during my first season, uh, getting ready for the playoffs that year. At the end of the first season, Hot Rod breaks his thumb in practice. So we went into the first round of the playoffs against the Chicago Bulls without Brad Darty, without Larry Nance, and without Hot Rod Williams. But we did sign Tim Kempton, who came back from Europe after playing over there. He got back about two weeks before the playoffs started, and we signed him to a a short contract. But going in without those three guys and then coming back, if you remember, the following season, Nance is gone, darty has gone, Hot Rod was coming back, but Gerald Wilkins tore his Achilles tendon Mm -hmm. and Mark Price broke his wrist. Right. So if you think about that, it was a disaster and it caused us to start over again that next time with that next group being the Bobby Phils, Chris Mills, right. that group that we endured, Ty- Tyrone Hill, Michael Cage, Danny Ferry. Right. Uh, that was kind of like group number two that I coached in Cleveland. And that lasted for two years. And if you remember, Terrell Brandon was in there. Right. Let's not leave him out. Okay, who wound up being an all star. And then the third group that I coached in Cleveland was the Brevin Knight, Zadrunas Ilgowska, Sean Kemp, Derek Anderson, Cedric Henderson. You know, that group that we put together as kind of the third bunch that I coached here. So I went through three separate groups here in Cleveland, of which the best was supposed to be the first one. And I just never had a chance to coach that whole group, which is. I felt terrible about because I would have loved the opportunity to try and coach that team. Well, it's funny because I had, I had in my notes here, I was going to say, what were the Cavs missing in the mid nineties? Well, at some point, I think they were missing pretty much everybody at some point in time. And you just pretty much nailed all those players that um, a lot of us kind of forget that were on the team and, you know, we're, we came back at various times and, you know, it seemed like the Cavs were that close, but we were snake bit every time. If you think about it, uh, and I often do, that period that we went through all of the adjustments, all of the changes, I had to change my coaching philosophy. And Mm -hmm. I always felt that my job as the head coach was to try and win as many games as we can. Develop players, try to win games, try to get to the postseason, try to win a championship. That's, I think, why they hire a head coach. And because of that, in years three four five and six we went to a different style of play we went to basically instead of everybody now increasing the pace and tempo we decreased it and we just decided that we were going to be great at the defensive end we were going to pay attention to small things we didn't care if the score wound up 94 91 
And we weren't trying to score 120 points a game. We wanted to know what a high percentage shot was. Three pointers were not as prevalent then, you know, as they are now. Uh, and our defense was outstanding. And we did make it to the playoffs, you know, four out of the six years uh, that I coached, or four out of the six seasons, I should say, that I did coach in Cleveland. But that coaching that style of play eventually wound up hurting my reputation as mm -hmm. a person that walks the ball up. You know, they don't play exciting basketball, et cetera, et cetera. You know, I had no defense to that other than check the record. Five out of seven years in Atlanta, four out of six years in Cleveland, we made the playoffs. That's, you know, I, I felt I was doing what I was supposed to do, and that is teach people how to play good basketball and win games. Unfortunately, we had to play a different way because we didn't have that first roster that I had with Mark Price and Brad. When you lose two all-stars, big men like Nance and Darty, when you lose an all-star guard like Mark Price, it's, you know, you have to figure out how do you play to win or do you just go out there and try and play the same way and wind up losing games? I didn't want to do that. I wanted to win basketball games. How, well, how long did it take you to completely, like, was it overnight? You thought to yourself, I need to change my philosophy. And once you came to that conclusion, how long did it take you to implement that with your coaches? You know, it's something that as fans, you see it, but how long did it take you guys to implement it to the point where you go, okay, now, now we see this coming together. It's a great question because I can remember the exact meeting that we changed everything. We started out uh, the season and we were 0 and 5. And we had a big team meeting at 0 and 5. Bobby Phils was the captain of the team at that time. And when we sat in the room on the walls of the locker room, we had these giant posters. And each poster represented game one, two, three, four, five. And we wound up breaking down each game to make them understand why we lost each game. And it didn't matter who we played, the great Chicago Bulls team, it was like 76-75 uh, with five and a half minutes to go in the game. Uh, and we're trying to run like hell going up and down the, the court, let's say. Uh, and I probably should say that was the third quarter, not the end of the game. But then... All of a sudden, Chicago would go on a 20 to 2 run. And the same thing would happen game in and game out. We were trying to run, trying to fast break, trying to push the ball back, but we didn't have the depth to play that way. And we saw it all five games. We'd point out here's where the game broke open. Here's where the game, here's where we fell apart. And now you're 0 5 and you get in the locker room. Everybody doesn't want, nobody wants to look at each other when you're 0 5. Everybody has an angry face on. Uh, everybody in their mind is blaming somebody else for the reason why we're 0 and 5. So we sat in that meeting and we explained to the team, here's what we think. We think if we slow it down, if we use the shot clock by passing the ball, defense doesn't want to play defense for five passes, six passes. They want you to shoot after two passes so they can get out of their defensive stance. So let's make them stay in their stance for 22, 23 seconds of the 24-second shot. Let's get great high-percentage shots. I said, if you pass the ball so many times that we get a 24-second violation, don't worry about it. But we've got to be great defensively. We've got to block out on every shot so they don't get second-shot opportunities. If we get a steal, if we get a block, we'll take the fast break. But other than that, when people score or we get a rebound and the break is not there, we walk it up, we get into our set plays, and we're going to execute and make them suffer with the pain of having to play defense for that long. And I said, I'm throwing it out to you because I think we're good enough to win. I think we're good enough to get to the playoffs, but it's going to be a major change in our style of play. So I'm going to leave you guys alone in the locker room. Bobby, you head this thing up. Come out and get me when you guys are ready. So coaches walked out of the room. We closed the team room door. And they took over and they, whatever they said amongst themselves, Bobby Phils comes out and he says, come on in coach. We walked back in and they said, we want to try it. We'll try it. So I, great. Well, the next game we played a very, very good San Antonio team with David Robinson mm -hmm. and, you know, all you guys say, anyhow, we lose to San Antonio on like right at the end of the game. I, if I remember it, um, 
It, it could have been on an out of side, out of bounds play that they scored and won the game. But we walked in the locker room and I looked at the team and I said, we're going to be fine. I said, if you can play that team that well, and they're a great team. I said, we're going to be fine. We were all in six, but I had a much different feeling. The next game, we played a very good Indiana team. Same thing happened. We lost by two. We lost by three. And I went in the locker room and said, everything's, we're good. We're good to go. Now we're 0-7. But that team went on to win 47 games that year and made the playoffs because we eventually got used to the style of play. We eventually made other people really work to have to defend us. We took high percentage shots. We made our free throws. Didn't give up second shot opportunities. And that's when it turned around, right in that stretch of game six, seven, eight, and then on the rest. Well, it just goes to show, Coach, knowing what you were able to do with the Cavs and those teams that you were so injury stricken that you were still be able to take them to the playoffs and have some success with with guys that you didn't think you were going to have success with or the, to that level. I mean, taking the teams four of the six years to the playoffs and and, you know, when you look back at your tenure, I mean, you, you got to think that's got to be impressive, but it's also little got to be a little annoying looking back, knowing all those guys were still hurt at that point in time. And it just never were able to live up to having a healthy Doherty price and Nance. And then of course, Wilkins, it's funny. I forgot about Gerald Wilkins blowing out his Achilles. When you mentioned that a little bit ago, I was like, Oh my gosh, I forgot about that. That, I mean, it just kept racking up and racking up. Um, I, I wanted to hey, ask John, you, John, let me just throw this in. Remember, four out of six years to the playoffs. And uh, another thing, if you remember back, one of those two years that we did not make it was when we came down in our own building at home, game number 82 of the regular season against Washington. And Washington had Strickland, Chris Weber, Howard, John Oldham. I don't know if you remember that. And uh -huh. we were playing each other for who gets the last playoff spot. I forgot in game about that. 82, yeah. Yeah. And we were up at we were up seven at the half, I believe seven at the half, seven or nine at halftime. And I remember saying to my assistant coaches, gosh, I I sure hope their coach, who happened to be Bernie Bickerstaff, father of <laughs> JB Bickerstaff. <laughs> and I still tease him to this day. I, I said to my coaches walking out on the floor at halftime, I hope he forgets to put Muris on in the game. George Murison, the seven foot six, seven yes. foot center big man that they had. We had Tyrone Hill playing, who was like six eight, six nine. Yeah. Well, sure enough, Bernie didn't forget. He put him in, and Murison goes with nine or 13 points in the second half. We lose the game to them down the stretch. Yeah. They go to the playoffs, and we don't. So, man, I, yeah, I think that's Murison, another one of the years. You're right. And I think Murison was actually seven seven, the tallest NBA player ever, I believe, oh, which, which validates your point even more so. Um, you know, coach, when you look back at 96 and this is, I need some good juicy tidbits here. I, I need to know because in 96, the Cavs, Wayne Embry took Vitaly uh, Patapico at that 12th pick. You know what happened in that next pick? The Charlotte Hornets took Kobe Bryant and then eventually traded the Lakers. Was Kobe ever on your radar? You know, things that you don't know for sure you shouldn't swear to but mm -hmm. i don't remember kobe coming up as a major thing because and, and here's the reason why we had lost all those you know the all-star big men and i'm going to count hot rod as another one of those all-stars mm -hmm. we had lost three men of all-star caliber and you know we had to rebuild the team and in this draft there were a few big men that we thought could help us so I'm not so sure that we didn't draft for need of position rather than if somebody said, who's the best talent? Well, I, yeah, I don't know. If, I don't know if we would have said Kobe's the best talent right now, because remember when Kobe went to the Lakers, he averaged seven and a half points a game sure, during right his here. first season. Mm -hmm. But then he did turn into a special person, special individual with the Lakers. But no, I, I would, I think I would be, making it up i said yeah we we couldn't choose between that that, that wasn't the case we mm -hmm. we knew we wanted big men and we got two big men in that first round vitale potapenko and zadrunas ilgauskas yeah z was picked later in that first round now we had talking about another big man a uh, good segue here 
we had Sean Kemp on the podcast last week. Uh, he talked and reflected on his short three years with the Cavs. And he said one of the reasons why in those later years when he was with the Cavs, because you coached him for two, I believe. He said one of the reasons why the team started to fall apart in his second season with the team was because the Cavs got rid of you. In fact, Kemp had a lot of praise for you. And I wanted to just take a moment here and play back what he had to say uh, about you, coach. This is what he had to say. But I really enjoyed playing in Cleveland. I actually, I was really disappointed in Cleveland when they got rid of Mike Fratello. Mike Fratello is a great coach, bro. Um, a lot of guys don't like him because he's kind of in your face guy. But I mean, generally, if you're, if you're from the Midwest, that's, the, that's what coaches are. They're generally in your face. So it wasn't a big deal to me, but I think a lot of guys had a problem with that. But I didn't have a problem with that. I think that our, our team in Cleveland would suffer because they fired Mike Fratello. I honestly believe that. Mike, he also went on to say that he put you up there with George Carl as his two favorite coaches of all time. When you just hear that, you heard that there, what were your thoughts? Well, I, uh, emotionally right now, it's, uh, it's, uh, very, very, it's wonderful to hear a person that played for you and spent the hours that he spent the dedication, uh, and, and then they come back and say something like that because I, I, I truly loved Sean Kemp. I knew how great he was in the beginning of his career. Then I knew he had some struggles. And when we got him, he was the 282-pound um, Sean Kemp. Not the, as they listed him, I can remember him saying during the first season, they had him listed on the uh, program as 200 and, uh, 248 or 245 for his weight. He said, coach, I haven't been that light since I was in high school. We started <laughs> laughing together, but you know, he put some weight on uh, and he came in at least two times every day during the beginning of that first season with us and worked and worked to get his weight down. And he probably dropped 16 pounds, 18 pounds in the beginning. And if you remember, wound up being an all-star when he joined us, he carried that team. He carried Zadrunas and Brevin and uh, Derek Anderson, Cedric Henderson. I mean, he was the guy. I mean, we went to him. We fed him in the low post. We told him to go to work. And then he would go and put fouls on people and get offensive rebounds. He'd kick it out to his teammates if they came and doubled him. He was just simply terrific in doing everything we asked of him to do. And they wound up having success and going to the playoffs. So I, I couldn't say more great things about Sean. That's the way I felt about him. And to hear that now, I, I, it makes me think that we had a special connection. Mm -hmm. And I'm very proud of that. So, Coach, you know, we, we've been over your history as an assistant coach and as a head coach. And, of course, your, your broadcasting career as well. So you've seen a lot of games. You coached a lot of games. The game, though, has changed a lot. It's evolved. Um, you know, it's, you know, it's, it's this hybrid game, three point shooting as an old school guy. And I'm, I'm seeing you as an old school guy. I'm an old school guy watching a lot of this over the years. Do you like or dislike the new NBA? And I'm seeing the new NBA in the last five to 10 years. I love the NBA. I love NBA basketball. It's the style of play that you have to become comfortable with. It's the changing in the philosophy which comes about because of how these young men are being brought up through AAU ranks, what they go through and what their mentality is. Some of the stuff when you first get these youngsters and you talk to them about it, it's almost like they're looking at you going like, what planet are you from? Like, where did you get that idea from that that should happen or, or we should be doing this or that? That's not the way it is, you know, unfortunately. It's it's. You know, this new younger generation of players uh, has been brought up a different way. And, and they they emphasize and work on doing things that are important to them in, in nowadays games rather than what was important years ago or when we were coaching. So the emphasis on defense, you know, not not quite the same now because pace and tempo become so important. 
running the floor, shooting threes in transition, living with shots that back 10, 15 years ago, coaches would have said, that, that's not a good shot. We can get a high percentage shot. We can do better than that. Well, it's different now. The, the, the league is different, as you mentioned. It's changed. So, you know, when people say to you, could you go back and coach guys nowadays? I, I don't know that. I, I think I could. I know I was asked to coach Team USA over the last two years in the international competition. And, you know, I felt comfortable with those guys. We tried to keep it very simple and uh, in the things that we put in. Uh, but you don't know until you're with them day in and day out because it's a, it's a different group of young men nowadays who have been brought through the system and the system has changed itself. What was a good shot uh, way back when? Nowadays, they don't even think about those shots anymore. You have to have a floater. You have to be able to shoot a three. Putting the ball on the floor and being able to dribble past your opponent is paramount in this dribble drive stuff that they do. And, you know, that then changes into it. And think about where analytics comes into it now. We didn't have analytics way back when. You know, you knew stats. You knew numbers. You did it as a head coach. Your assistants did it. But now you're being given sheets and sheets of paper every day pointing out you know who should do this and who should do that and when it's a rest day when a guy shouldn't practice you know back then I can remember in training camp you had 28 days of training camp when I first became a head coach we wrote every day we had practice on every day and the first eight nine ten days were double sessions mm -hmm. but I figured you could always call practice off if you wanted to <laughs> but why put in there an off day if you might want to practice that day? So when they would get their team books and they'd look at the calendar, I'd see them rolling their eyes like, oh, man, we're going to practice every day. No off days. But then, you know, you eventually give them a day off here and a day off there when you felt they needed it. But now you have different people controlling their lives and controlling mm -hmm. the coaches' lives because of what the analytics numbers show. And when it's time, when the workload is too heavy, et cetera, et cetera. And that, that's what's happened. Mm -hmm. You know, talking about coaching, you know, a lot of Cavs fans or really casual NBA fans probably forget, Mike, that you coached the Ukraine national basketball team for three years from 2011 to 2014. How did that opportunity come about? A young man named uh, Sasha Volkov, who I drafted in Atlanta for the Hawks, played for us in Atlanta for the Hawks. 6'10", he's ahead of his time, 6'10", small forward. He could put the ball on the floor. He could dribble, drive, uh, pull up and shoot. Uh, loved him. Loved him as a person. Loved him as a player. He, you know, he joined the very good Hawks team, so it was tough for him to get a lot of minutes behind a guy named Dominique Wilkins. But having said that, we always maintained our relationship. And he called one day and said, actually, the NBA called me. A young lady named Kim Bahuni called, and she's like Miss International for the NBA. Uh, is involved with every country and and uh, setting up the games and matches and things like that that the USA Basketball does. So Kim called and said, "Mike, got a question for you." Sasha Volkov asked me, "Do you think Mike Fratello would consider coaching the Ukraine national team?" And she said, "Why don't you call and ask me?" Ah, oh, you know. I, I don't want to ask Mike how I feel. She goes, Let me, I'll call him and ask him. So she called, asked, and I said, I'd be happy to talk to him about it if, if he wants to talk about it. And that's how it started. He called, talked. We laid everything out. I, I told him I, I would have to bring a number of assistants over with me to help in the teaching coaching process. I wound up bringing six coaches over with me, a video guy, a, a workout conditioning guy. And then the assistant coaches that would help, you know, one of which was um, actually Jay Laranega was with me the one year. Mm -hmm. Jay's an assistant with the Los Angeles Clippers right now. Um, Kenny, who was with me in year number one, uh, Ken Atkinson, who was the coach, the head coach of the Brooklyn Nets. Now he's on the bench up in Portland. Uh, those were guys that came over with me. Bob Hill came over with me. Joe Wolf came over with me. Um, guys that came over and gave up three, four months of their lives to go over and mm -hmm. teach and coach basketball in the Ukraine. And, you know, the country had never 
never been to the world championship at the end in the fourth year. Not only have we been to two Euro championships the first year and the third year, but then we wound up making the, the cut for the world championship. and We played in the world championship in year number four, which was a great honor that, mm -hmm. you know, those guys worked that hard and accomplished that in four years. What was the biggest adjustment for you coaching players that, you know, grew up playing that European style of basketball? You know, I never looked at it really that way, to be honest. I, I went in and said, this is what we're doing. Uh, we did, a, a, I thought, a very good job of using video uh, to show what we wanted, to show how things are done. Uh, they loved watching any games that we, that we had brought with us. Uh, they loved watching the games, the playoffs, explaining, teaching, coaching, showing what you do versus double teams, you know, how you play the pick and roll, et cetera, et cetera. They, they were like sponges. They wanted to learn. They wanted to absorb. And this exposure for them, having six NBA coaches, you know, working with them, they were they were in heaven. I mean, they, they felt so blessed that they're getting guys who were coaching in, in the NBA who had been successful head coaches in the NBA. They've got them working with them day in and day out. Uh, and I, I had to throw them out of the gym. You know, we'd, we'd usually practice twice a day. And when they come in early in the morning, like uh, whether it was Kenny Atkinson, whether it was Jay Larry Nager, they after breakfast, they'd tell them, we'll meet you over in the gym in, in 30 minutes, 35, 40 minutes. Well, that would be an hour ahead of practice starting. Then when practice would end, they would stay an hour and a half after practice, drilling them, shooting drills, working on technique. And finally I had to say, out, get out. We have lunch Come, You know, they did not want to leave. They wanted to wow. absorb everything that they could. And, and then we just put our stuff in, what we felt we wanted to run offensively, what we wanted to do defensively. And I didn't look at it like, you know, if you see – that because of the style of play they were used to playing that they couldn't run that stuff. You better be smart enough as a coach to throw it out and not try and mm -hmm. you were, you weren't going to be able to change them in three months. Okay. You can give them stuff to work on. And then during a the regular season, when they go back and play for the regular teams, you can improve on when you come back next mm -hmm. summer. I want to I want you to be better at these things. But when you're there with the immediacy of having to win, to get into the, the Euro championships, whatever, you better do stuff that they can do and, and do well because you want them to go to their A move, not worry about move number C, which they're never going to use in the game anyhow. So I, I thought our coaches really did a great job of, of getting that point across and working with them and, and we tried to play to their strengths. But your good friend and legendary broadcaster Marv Albert dubbed you the czar of the telestrator for your masterful ways of diagramming uh, basketball players or basketball plays excuse me on screen do you remember what year he gave you that nickname and what do you think after all these years people still just call you the czar in the street i can't thank him enough he, <laughs> he, he well, i really can't because i mean think about that the, it came I, I can tell you exactly it was i can tell you the date i can't tell you the year How about that the, the that works. day was august 5th and the reason I know that it's when NBC took over the rights to broadcasting the NBA games. Mm. CBS, if you remember, had held the rights before that. Mm -hmm. But NBC came in, outbid CBS and got the rights to it. So over the summer, you know, Marv is hired immediately as the voice of the NBA. They go through a process. The two people they were looking at to be Marv's partner were Chuck Daly and Pat Riley. They brought me into New York for an interview uh, audition, I'll call it. And the guy who auditioned me was Bob Costas. So think about that. Starting mm. out your broadcast career and you're sitting across from Bob Costas doing an audition. So when it was done, my agent called and said, listen, they just wanted to remind me, you are only auditioning for the sideline job. Mm. Like, you know, maybe twice a game you'll come on and say, hey, this is what's going on, whatever. Okay, fine. I was out of a job at the time. So, well, what happens is Chuck Daly sits down and says to them in negotiations, look, let's not drag this thing out. Let's just get to the final number so we can move on. So they gave they gave him the final number and Chuck went, are you serious? And they went, yeah, that's it. And he went, oh, I'm going back to coaching. 
So he went back and he took the next <laughs> job. That's what happened. And then Pat had been, you know, he and the Lakers kind of parted ways that year. And Pat said, man, Pat said, they said, well, you know, Pat, you'll be alongside Marv Albert doing the game. He said, I don't want to do the games. He said, I want to be in the studio. And they were like, well, how could you be the studio host when you've never done a TV show in your life? And he said, well, get somebody next to me that is really good. And then he and I will do it together. So <laughs> thusly, Bob Costas winds up on the air in the studio with Pat Riley. And if you remember, they'd have that little like hoop up at the end of the game and they would right. take shots with the small ball at the end of the game going off the Sunday broadcast. That's right. So I get a, I get a call from my agent and he goes, you're not going to believe this. I go, what? He goes, guess who the leading candidate is to be the color analyst with Marv Albert? I go, who? And he said, you. And I go, wow. But he didn't realize that I'm best friends with Chuck Daly and Pat Riley. <laughs> so I kind of <laughs> knew what was going on. And Shazam. So NBC brings us into New York a couple of times with getting and helping them out as much as we could with input from our standpoint. And they finally said, you know, we better do a game before we get to the season. So they said, Magic Johnson has written in his contract that he gets one day a year to use the forum and he uses it for Magic Johnson's summer midnight madness. And the money he makes on that, he donates to the charities that he wants. So they said, what do you think about doing that game? And Marv says, you know, I, I'm just going along for the ride. Whatever they say, I'm going to do. Right. So Marv, Marv says, okay. And Marv calls me and he goes, I hope you're ready for this. He said, because remember, the score is probably going to wind up 200 to like 199 at the end of the game. Well, we come on air that night and they've got Marv in a single shot on camera. He says, you know, welcome everyone to NBC Sports and NBC taking over the NBA. And da -da 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 -da. I was so excited to be here. And uh, I'd like you to meet. And with that, they, you know, widen the shot out. And here I am standing there. And he goes, I'd like to introduce you to my partner, the czar of the Telestrator, Mike Fratello. I had no idea where it came from. Nobody did. But he had sat in his room thinking of things that he could call me to introduce me by. And that's, that's the greatness of him. He comes up with a name, calls me the czar. And I don't know if I was ever Mike Fratello again in a broadcast <laughs> with him. It was always like, Czar, how are you? You know, and he'd welcome me on. And and that that's what it was for so many years. And as you mentioned, still still being used today on the broadcast. Yeah, not many nicknames can stick. And that one has stuck really, really well. Everyone knows you as the Czar. And yeah, that's great. You know, it's crazy too. Marv Albert just retired last year. I know TNT brought you back last year to do some games with him in his final year. And, and uh, man, when I think back in my early days watching the NBA, not just the Cavs, it was always, you know, NBA and NBC, you know, uh, with, with Marv. And of course, you know, you were part of a lot of those broadcasts and, and then you go more local with the Cavs and things like that. And um, what, what a legend, not just in the NBA, but just in, in American sports broadcasting lore in Marv Albert. He's one of my closest friends. We we just talked yesterday for about 15 or 20 minutes and bright, bright, bright person, just so well read on everything and avid moviegoer. Mm. Uh, what made him so special in basketball is he actually, you know, he knew the game. You know, remember, he was a Knicks ball boy growing up mm. and knew what how to play basketball and understood and so when he was broadcasting the games, it was not unusual. You know, Marv got so much of it right. He was right on the head and seeing what he was seeing, seeing what he was watching um, as he was doing the broadcast. So it made it, it made it so much fun to do those games with him. And we had so many enjoy, you know, the, the greatness of the 92 Olympics being there, calling that entire, you know, Olympic series of USA basketball dream team one being part of that whole thing and, and so many other finals and great games along the way together. And, and then like a little side thing, like today I, I got an envelope in the mail and I opened the envelope up and Marv invited me to be part of a movie that we made and it was called just right. And maybe you've seen it on the air, but uh, just right. wound up being out in the movie theaters and then taken over by, 
you know, the Netflix or wherever else got a hold of it. So every once in a while we get our check uh, for the residuals. So I, th I think my last check was for ninety six dollars. Uh, so I, I better call him back and thank him, or he'll never, never leave me alone saying that I didn't appreciate it. And, right. You know that's how I am. Uh, you know I never think about him, but I'll call him tomorrow and, and tell him thanks that I got another residual check of ninety six dollars. So and that's just, a big one. That's, that's a big a, one, by the way. <laughs> that's a big one. Yeah, I just looked that movie up. I've never heard of it, but it was a uh, romantic comedy in twenty ten. Yeah, it, it was. You know who was in there? Common. Yeah, the Queen rapper. Latifah. Sure. Queen Latifah. She was terrific. He Common was great. Uh, we we did our taping up where the Nets used to play in Jersey at the Meadowlands Arena. They mm -hmm. closed that arena down for like three or four days to set up all the cameras and everything. Kenny Smith. It was Kenny Smith, Marvin, and I were the make believe broadcasters doing the game, and you know, Common is coming down the court and incurs a knee injury on a spin move collision and he goes down and they need him back for the playoffs and queen latifah comes in and she's gonna like you know nurse him back do the rehab on him to get him back you know just and then the romance behind it and all that and it was it was a cute movie wow the residuals the, the gift they keep on giving <laughs> there you go yeah, I, one thing I didn't think we were going to get into on this interview with you, Coach, is talking about romantic comedies with Queen Latifah and Rapper Common. That's a new one. <laughs> you never know what you're going to get when you're dealing with the czar. It comes yeah. from anywhere. It comes from left field. There it is. Wow, Scott. Mike Fratello just dropped so much knowledge on us on so many different things. We can reflect on this for hours on end, but due to time constraints, mm -hmm. we won't do that. But no, we a couple, won't. A couple of things that jump out at me real quick here. And, and there's going to be more to Mike Fratello here. That was just part one of our two part interview with the legendary NBA head coach. There's a lot of things there to digest. I'm just going to pick one right out of the gate. I love for the it. fact that uh, he was moved emotionally by Sean Kemp's comments that Sean's mm -hmm. told us in our last episode that sound like Mike had never heard that type of um, opinion and take of Sean to coach Fratello. And it really seemed like it really moved him emotionally. And uh, you know, to me, that was one of the many highlights of our part one interview there with coach Fratello. Right. And you could really hear it in his voice. Um, one little tidbit about his history. I didn't realize now I know he coached, um, you know, for, for years and years in the, well, in the NBA and, and, and also as an assistant in, in college, but also he started out as a driving instructor at his old <laughs> college. I how mean, about that? How, and he even admitted, he goes, I just put gas in the car and turn the thing on, but he started out as a driving instructor, almost as a way of getting into coaching. And that was his foot in the door. Yeah, he got a call to go to Rhode Island, right. and he eventually moved on and went there. And the rest, as they say, is history. Well, that was a great interview with uh, Mike Fratello, part one. Remember, mm -hmm. part two is going to be coming up here next week. We want to let you guys know uh, ways to get in touch with us here on Twitter. You can follow and uh, tweet at me, at John underscore Sable. And you mm -hmm. can also tweet at our podcast handle, at Sable Brothers. And you can also tweet at me, too. It's my name, Scott Sable, F-O-X, and the number eight. And remember, subscribe and listen to all of our episodes on Apple and Spotify. If you haven't been doing that already, go ahead and uh, subscribe. That way you get notifications of new episodes that come, including part two of our conversation with Mike Fratello. Scott, that was great. I can't wait for our listeners to get into part two with uh, the former Cavs coach. A lot of juicy stuff here. I'm looking forward to it. Thanks for listening, everyone.